hasn't been on display in over 20 years. So is there a way we can get that on the floor and engage people with one of the few objects we do have in astronomy that's tangible? So those are the types of things that go into it. What are the different ways we can actually connect people with astronomy? Um, and what ways can we actually engage them with the concepts? And can we try to have some diversity in how we do that in there for for people who want to learn different things and connect with astronomy in different ways and have different modes of learning and so on. Do you have any favorite exhibits out there? The Earth is always exciting, but it has this mm -hmm. one button that makes it rotate. That, that, I like that one a lot just because kids love pushing that button. And there's something about pushing a button and making this big globe rotate that can make, the, like, even the biggest kids get so excited. Uh, I do want us to update that and have a little more interpretation around the earth, but there's something about that button. Um, but <laughs> um, beyond that, I don't know. They're all really cool. The Geocon's pretty cool, actually. Because that thing is also almost as old as the entire planetarium, but it's still this thing that's working so well. And it's just, all it does is it's showing you a flat version of the map, but it shows you where the Earth is currently hitting, or where the Sun is currently hitting the Earth. And you can actually see it change its shape as we go through the seasons. You can see the Northern Hemisphere get more light in our summer, and then as you go into the Southern Hemisphere summer, they get more light. On the equinoxes, it's straight up and down, and it's still fairly accurate, even down to a minute or so. And But it's also amusing to go out there, because it's just, again, that historical connection with us. Like You see that it's still the USSR, and it's still Burma, not Myanmar, and things like that. <laughs> so, like, oh yes, this is a very old map. But it's still pretty accurate in terms of how it's actually telling us information. If you could design a sort of dream exhibit, what would that look like? Probably the meteorite one that we're planning right now. That's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, that that would probably... The way that we currently have it planned is the dream exhibit out there. Because um, I think a bigger dream would be to like just completely redo that and like take up far, far more floor space with, exhibit talk, with exhibits. Because there's a lot of different things we can do, like that we keep coming up with. Like, it'd be really cool to have one where you can actually change the altitude of the sun, or make like a mini planetarium where you can have a little more control. But these are all like down the road and need more space. But the one that we're working on right now is our meteorite collection and putting that on display. And we're doing that. We want to put that into archival um, museum storage, essentially storage drawers where. People can pull them open, but they'll have plexi plexiglass covers that are lockable so people can get up really close, but we can still protect the specimens. But they can get up really close and kind of have that discovery moment when they open the drawer. We're going to highlight Michigan meteorites so that there's this really local connection for people that they can see that their state where they live actually has physical connections to the solar system beyond just us being on the Earth, which is sort of every day at this point. It has to be. Uh, we're always on the Earth, except for astronauts. Um, but we can highlight that very nice connection there. We want to bring in um, some media about sort of the future of how we're going to explore the solar system and make that interactive in some way for people as well um, so that they still have some sort of interactivity. But we don't want to just have media for the sake of media either. We want to have that actually have specific learning goals. And we also want to have hands-on activities where people can actually lift um, in a safe way, lift different kinds of meteorites to feel the density differences. And we want to give them magnets so that they can actually test the magnetism of the, the meteorites and interact with them. And these are things we can do, but they're not on permanent display. Um, so getting, getting that out there and talking about just all these different ways that meteorites, space rocks, interact with us. Um, and because there is something still really cool. You show a kid a rock. Like, yeah, that's a rock. You tell them it's a space rock, then it's really cool. Then doesn't matter that it doesn't look any different than when they thought it was a rock, but once you tell them it's from space, that makes it that much more engaging. engaging. And since we do have so few hands-on tangibles in astronomy, this is one of those ways to really get people touching and feeling and 
in a, in a safe way. So, What are some of the other tangible objects in astronomy? It's the tools, things like telescopes. So we do have our very first MSU telescope in our lobby at the moment. I would like to make that um, more interactive. Right now it's just in a case. And it's there because it's safe, but it would... Um, I know the Adler has this really cool old telescope from the 1600s. They have it covered in plexiglass, but at the very end you can still look through the tube. And then it's looking at like a series of mirrors that bounces around to get the distance you need to look at a picture of Saturn through it, essentially. So I'd love to do something with that to like get engage people with these historical tools. So we have that. We have some sextants and things like that. So those I think are some of the other big tangibles. Um, and, and it could even be the more modern tools tool, not, not the necessarily the historical ones. So I think one of the coolest experiences I've, I can remember from undergraduate is I was in my professor's office and he worked on the Stardust mission. And this was a mission that went out into space. It had, it, it's um, opened up these wings essentially filled with a material called aerogel, which is a solid that's not really much denser than air. So if you're holding a piece of aerogel, it literally feels like you are holding air, which is really indescribable beyond that until you do this. But it, would, it did this, flew by a comet, and actually picked up dust particles off the tail and brought it back to Earth. So we have some of those. Like, we don't have them, but like, we as humanity have these now. But the aerogel is still a tool, and that's something that I would love to get my hands on and actually let people... Um, let people hold and have that experience of holding air because um, it's it's super weird and it's super mm -hmm. awesome <laughs> so I forgot where I was going with that but those are I guess some of the yeah the other tangibles is really it comes down to the tools that we use and the the materials that we engineer in order to make these things happen so So what, in your opinion, is the purpose of the Blacklight Gallery? To me, the Blacklight Gallery is very much a transition space. Um, so when you walk in that Blacklight Gallery, especially when we have a school group, they're out in the lobby, it's fairly bright out there, there's cool stuff to see. And then you open the doors to the Blacklight Gallery and they walk in immediately you get the, oh, this is so cool, I'm glowing, oh my goodness. And that's this place for them to get really excited, and it sort of primes them for what they're going to see in the planetarium. And that, that ooing and aahing doesn't stop even once you get into the theater. Uh, but it's, it's sort of this really nice transition space, like getting you ready to think about astronomy and think about space in a dark space with with glowing lights and things like that. So I think, to me, that's the purpose that I've seen it be used as, really. It is this, this exciting preparatory space for even more excitement later. <laughs> um, so I think there's also an opportunity to, to engage people in other ways. So that's why we have a, currently a group of museum studies students from U of M for their capstone project. Um, they're kind of thinking through other ways we can engage people with the actual science that's in there because we can't always stop and talk about it and there's not a lot of interpretive labels in there right now so what are some other ways we can do that but I think the overall function will remain the same as not only is it its own exhibit space of so here's really cool scientifically accurate paintings it's still just really cool space to get you ready to get into the theater. Do you have a favorite painting? Yes. They're all really cool, so, I mean, there's only one that marginally gets above. But there is this, uh, the one of the Lunar Lander. Um, I really love the Lunar Lander one, and I think I just didn't realize the level of detail in it until I had done our show, The Moonbeams, one time, and we were talking about this stuff, and I was looking at it, and I'm like, oh, I can actually use that to talk about the lunar landing mission. And then just next to it, sort of across a doorway, is also um, a painting of astronauts on the moon, which goes along really nicely with it. And I didn't realize it until, I thought I'd say a week or two ago, 
Windows Museum of Studies students are here. But if you look in the helmet, there's a little reflection of another astronaut taking the picture. And we have that as a photograph. That's also something we put in our Moon Game show. And it's Neil Armstrong was taking a picture of Buzz Aldrin. And so you can see him reflected in the helmet. And they got that detail in this painting from, this probably would have been in the 70s that it was actually painted after the, the landing. And I'm just like, that's awesome. And so there's just like these little things that if you look around and you look carefully, you can pick them out. And it's really nice to find those hidden surprises. How often are the paintings updated? So a lot of them are original to the building as far as I know. Others will know the history a little better than I do. Um, I think the last time they were updated was probably the 80s. And so I think there was some updates with the lunar landing and a couple that were added in, like the astronaut and the lunar lander. And I, th I think it won, I want to say in the 80s, the one with Saturn, where you're looking at Saturn from the moon Titan. Apparently there like used to be some higher mountains and they brought those down at some point, so they modified that one. But no one here has ever been around when they've been updated that currently works here. Um, except for maybe Mary. So talk to her. <laughs> she would know better. What is it like watching the audience during a show in the Sky Theater? It's fun. It's really fun. Um, I mean, some audiences are just really quiet and you can't quite tell, but I had first graders in there yesterday and it's this, it's a show that used to work on slide projectors and then it just got kind of converted, but it's still this sort of stop motion kind of animation of like a bird flying. It's like wings up, wings out, wings up, wings down. So it's not very smooth, um, but these first graders just loved it. Like as soon as the lights go down and like the first bit of music, it's like, oh, whoa, and, they, and they, the way that they just get so into it, it's just, it's so much fun to watch that. And um, there's certain shows in particular that I, I, there's certain moments I'll look forward to. There's, this is maybe letting the cat out of the bag. We have one that is uh, called Natural Selection, which we run for the MSU Museum. It's about Darwin. It's not an astronomy show at all. And in it, there's this beautiful like shot of a seagull flying in the air, and it just holds on the seagull flying for a while.